Hey, I'm Scott Hathcock again with Moonshot at NASA. This is our Makers and Shakers video series, and I am privileged tonight to have our guest, Evan Anderson from Drinking Horde Meadery, who happens to have been our Arizona Pioneer Pitch competition winner for not only Flagstaff in 2019, but also you ended up winning the state That's championship, right. if you will, that APS sponsored. Championship. That's right. That's yeah. right. So congratulations. Oh, thank and you. In fact, as you can see, we're already sitting here with your product. And since it's happy hour, uh, let's toast to your uh, uh. 2020 survival. Survival. <laughs> That's all we're shooting for in okay. 2020. So tell me really quickly, what am I about to take a sip of? You're about to take a sip of cranberry mead. This just came out last week. Um, it's a big fan of folks for the Thanksgiving sort of season. You think about pairing that with some turkey. Yes. Mm. I'm already thinking about just drinking this alone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Forget the turkey. One of my favorite pairings is uh, air with it. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, I like it. It goes I like nicely it. with it. Very good. So Evan, who who would have thought, I mean, it's it's uh, well, it's December 2020 now. Yeah. Who would have thought uh, a year ago that we'd be sitting here under these circumstances? Nobody. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so before we dive into all that, though, uh, you have this company, you had this, you had this dream, you had this concept. Tell me about the day Drinking Horn Meadery was born. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, the real day that it was born was probably my wife and I's wedding. Um, I want it to be romantic. The term honeymoon comes from mead. You're oh. supposed to have enough honey wine to last a moon cycle. Um, okay. And so I wanted to be romantic with it and make a bunch of mead for the wedding. And uh, it went over really well, made like 30 gallons and uh, got a few kegs of beer from one of our local breweries here. And uh, nobody drank any of the beer and drank all the mead. And next day they were coming back asking, you got any more of that mead stuff? Gotcha. And uh, I got started making mead just because I had always raised bees. And somebody one day was like, you ever made mead? And I was like, what the heck is mead? Right. And I uh, started drinking it, started loving it, and then stepped into the stuff made for the wedding. And the wedding went over so well that it was like, well, I was kind of looking for a change in career path at the time. And uh, if people were going to be drinking all my mead all the time, I figured I might as well be selling it to them. Yeah. So, so you learned how to make this on watching YouTube videos? YouTube videos, and uh, I've read a few old books that had... Uh, really old books. Right? Really old <laughs> books, yeah. They talked about like the magic paddle, where okay. they would have this basically nasty yeast-ridden paddle, uh -huh. and they would stir up a batch of honey water with it. Sometimes they would get the honey water just from washing out the comb okay. to make wax, because wax during some of these periods was actually more of a commodity than the honey was, because... You know, they didn't have light bulbs. So wax for making candles and stuff was pretty pretty high dollar commodity. Right. And so some of these old these old books talk about, you know, floating a, a hen's egg in there to figure out your, your proper sugar content and stuff like that. We've obviously modernized those recipes a little bit. I float mm -hmm. no eggs in any of our meat. <laughs> So, so, and what about the bees? Were you already raising bees? Were I was already, already raising bees, okay. yeah. I, how long I, had you been doing that? I grew up raising bees. Uh, my dad taught me how to, to work bees when I was just a, just a wee little runt. And uh, it just kind of continued on from there. And uh, when I kind of settled down here in Flagstaff, um, I started raising bees again. And somebody was, that's where they were asking, you know, what do you do with your honey? And I was mm -hmm. like, harvest it, feed it back to the bees, mm -hmm. you know, don't do a whole lot with it. And they were like, why don't you make mead? And it just went downhill from there. It's a perfect storm. Yeah, it really was. <laughs> it was. It just kind of all fit together nicely, especially, right. you know, looking back on things, it, it all fell into place, just right. like you would hope it would, I guess. Gotcha. So, so the wedding happens. This, uh, your customer base is building, right? Mm -hmm. You're hearing the cry. Uh, what happened after that? Um, so it took a, took a long time with the licensing stuff. It took us almost a year and a half from the wedding to start in on all the licensing, or to get all of our licensing back. Um, just going through, you know, the feds and the state and the local and everything. Um, and during that time, we were just refining recipes and working on sort of fine-tuning our product. Um, and we still do. I mean, five years later, and I'm still, we're still fine-tuning product every, every time we make something. How, how, many, how many varieties do you have right now? Uh, currently on tap at the Mead Hall, we have uh, 16 different wow. varieties. Okay. Um, and we usually, I mean, we keep five, six flavors on all the time. And everything else kind of comes and goes as seasonal. So like the root beer is a seasonal, cranberry is a seasonal. Uh, by the time this comes out, root beer might be gone. Okay. It's, uh, it goes fast. It goes really fast. Gotcha. So you, you, you got all your licensing, you got all of your um, trademarks, patents, all that stuff uh, arranged and lined up. You already had a facility here in Flagstaff? Yeah. Or were you making it all out of your had house? Had to have the facility to get the first license. Okay. And that was one of the big, like... Uh, stepping you know stones in this or things to get past a wall to break through if you mm -hmm. will was that you know you needed to have a location and start paying rent before you could 
actually, you know, get the federal license put in because they needed a non-residential address to be able to file the license. And so you have to get that, like, you know, that address and then Go. file. So it took a little while. And during that period, I mean, we had, you know, one tank and we were just kind of slowly putting things together. That's a 2,000 square foot warehouse now and it's just so full of tanks and bottles of mead. It's it's pretty fantastic. That's awesome. That's awesome. And so you 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 lined all that up. You started working, and then how did how did we get involved? When did Moonshot come into the picture for you guys? We needed some help. Okay, is really what we needed. I mean, I had a good idea, but I didn't know how to go about implementing that from a good idea into an actual functional business. I love um, that. And it's, it was, <laughs> we talk about that, but I love it. You know, when was, I hear an really entrepreneur was. say that, yeah, it was perfect. Because you're an expert. You're an, already an expert in making this. At least an amateur expert. We'll call it an amateur expert. Okay, all right, all right. All right. <laughs> and but, so it really was. I needed the help in how to run a business. You know, okay. I knew how to make a product. Um, I knew there was demand for the product, but I didn't know anything about going through and figuring out. I was like, QuickBooks? What? <laughs> right, what is right. this? And so you guys helped us out with a lot of that. I was taking classes here initially before I even did the, the moonshot portion of thing. Gotcha. Taking classes and just trying to learn learn as much as I can, you know? Mm -hmm. Game life is a game and I'm I'm shooting for max points. So yeah. it was try to learn everything I could about it, everything that we could get from you guys. And then when the, the moonshot stuff came up, it was just a, an opportunity we couldn't pass up. So let's talk about that. So just for those people who don't know what that is, so Moonshot had a had and will continue to have sometime mm -hmm. in the near future. Uh, an Arizona Pioneer Pitch Tour, which meant that we went across the state to a bunch of cities, hosted three-day events, and, and brought in folks like you who applied. How did you apply? Do you remember? Um, we applied by putting together the, the short video, our elevator pitch, basically. Okay, gotcha. And putting together a video of our elevator pitch, which was good right from the start because that started sort of solidifying my ideas for how I wanted to run a business, mm -hmm. what I wanted the focus to be. And uh, so like, just putting together that video was eye-opening it's for somebody it, that it, didn't know how to run a business it know? is pretty cool when you articulate whatever it is your dream is or vision is mm -hmm. it grounds it somehow or at least you hear it a couple of times and you yeah. become you know even better at articulating it absolutely because it's the thing that you walk in the bank with mm -hmm. you walk up to your first friends or fool who will give you money for this idea this concept and you say here's what i want to do and it has to be quick you know yeah. because people don't have a lot of time or they want to be captured immediately and hooked right right how my name is Evan and welcome to Drinking Horn Beatery. Mead is fermented from honey, just like wine is made from grapes and beer is made from grain. My wife and I started putting this business together after our wedding when the people attending absolutely loved the mead we had made for the celebration. Since we started sales in 2017, we have grown rapidly. We now have statewide wholesale distribution. Our online store sells direct to consumers in 39 states. Our product is carried in Whole Foods Market and liquor stores across Arizona. We employ three people full-time and we'll be quickly needing more as the company grows. The process is slow and takes us about six months to get from ingredients to bottles. We use local honey and as much local and organic fruit as we can possibly get our hands on. Quality ingredients make for a quality product. We initially thought that the demographic for me was going to be primarily the millennial generation. Younger folk, more familiar with Game of Thrones, eager to try new things. We thought wrong. Mead is enticing to every single person that drinks alcohol. It's not often that you get to introduce someone to an entirely new alcohol. There are many meaderies in the U.S. at this point, most of which seem content to model their business after craft breweries um, where they make mead for serving at their own location with a minor amount of wholesale. We see the business opportunity to become a nationwide producer of mead. We have been requested to do tasting events all over the U.S. for biker bars, military shows, fashion shows, women's realtor associations, country music festivals, corporate parties, metal shows, rap concerts, farmers markets, golf tournaments, BET award after parties, retirement communities, and we even got featured on Food Network in Guy's Family Road Trip. We are poised and ready to expand our reach through distribution in other states. Meat is a wave and we need to be on the front of it. This is where Moonshot comes in for us. We have seen the business expansion that Moonshot has helped facilitate and we feel like we can be the next great model in that. We are currently producing roughly 2,100 bottles a month. Our facility was built with expansion in mind and we can produce over 10,000 bottles a month here with increases in equipment, personnel, and systems management. Thank you for your time. So you did the video and you applied for Flagstaff's The City competition first. Yes. Okay. And then you won that. It went over well. Yeah. And I, I, do, I, remember, I do like to talk about me. So I don't know. 
<laughs> so that was awesome. And then we followed up later mm -hmm. with a uh, another competition for the state. Yeah. And then you won that. It was it was a lot bigger that one was. Yeah, it was a, yeah. A little so, bigger audience that exactly. one. But in between those two competitions, didn't you start thinking ahead and planning and we did. this concept of what opened up? The Mead Hall. Right. So it was one of our big problems that we were by by working with you guys and refining what our vision was and figuring out not just the parts that I want to do, but the components that are needed to run a business, um, we realized that our, our tap room was something that was extremely lacking. It was it was it pretty was tiny. small, right? Yeah. It was like eight yeah. by eight, maybe, if that? Yeah, or... if that. Okay, and I remember it was even in the video yeah. that you showed. Yeah, yeah, okay. we started off, I think, in the, in the tap room there, yeah. and it's like you couldn't even get a good picture of the place because it was so small. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, how do I get this? Yeah. Um, so it was really small, and that was something that we could see was, was room that we could improve on. And... Um, it would get so packed too, which is you know a good sign, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But like Saturday, Sunday, if we ever had events, anything like that, we were only open three days a week. And you really have to know where that place is too. It's not yeah. a, it's not a drive. -by. No walk yeah. through traffic exactly. at all. You really had to be searching, and not like and our SEO wasn't so great back then either. So like you really had to be searching for it. We might have been second page back on Google or something. So. Gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> and uh, so that was what we decided was you know we needed to change something there, and when the the space in downtown opened up and for a, a reasonable price for downtown Flagstaff and everything, we kind of jumped on it pretty quickly. And it's not only downtown, it is right on Route 66. Right on Route yeah. 66, the only meadery in the world on Route 66. Nice, nice. <laughs> and first ever, perhaps. Who and knows? first ever, I think, quite yeah. possibly, yeah. Right. We have to check Chicago's records. We will, we will. Right. <laughs> Just check it. We'll, we'll check, we'll All check. Right. <laughs> so, so in between those two pitch competitions, you had already started to grow your business. Mm -hmm. You decided it really was a gamble. Take a gamble on a, a larger Huge retail gamble. space, and uh, and then you started construction. I, I'm September, trying to remember. Yeah. Okay, we so, started construction in September 2019, and I think our event that year was in October, or September, right? Yeah, yeah. So it was, it was right. It was right time. in that same thing. Yeah, and I think I remember in your pitch for that stage uh, competition, state competition, you had just signed the we lease paper. Just signed it. Yep. Okay. So it was. So it you was won real again. Fresh. Yeah, so you won again. Everybody's excited to drink mead in Flagstaff. And then... And then 2020. And then 2020 happens. <laughs> it took us a lot longer to build out than we originally expected. Okay. You know, it was our first time drawing blueprints. It was our first time. And we you know, pretty much gutted the place and rebuilt it. Plumbing, electrical, everything from the wow. ground up. Okay. Um, so it was on a 100-year-old building, you know, working with the Historic Building Commission and all those folks was a lot. Yeah. But, you know, we got through it. Um, and so it took us a little bit longer. Our original opening date, we were like, signed it in September, like we were going to be done with this by December. Right. And then you get a little bit into doing it and you're like, okay, maybe January. And then you get a little, you know, another month further and you're like, okay, maybe like March. <laughs> right. And then, and this was still, you know, before in 2019. COVID. Yeah, 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 totally. It was before there was even rumor of it, you know. Right. And, uh, and then by the time we were starting to look at what date we were actually going to open, it was like, okay, April 10th should be reasonable. Okay. And this was still pre-COVID. Right. And uh, so we're building out. We're getting closer and closer and closer to this coming, and, and everything gets shut down. Mm -hmm. And it's so tough the, times. So the good and bad about that is now you're not having to take an environment that you created for pre-COVID. Now mm -hmm. you're taking the environment that you're about to open, and you're making it COVID friendly, right? Exactly. So what did that look like from a financial model? What were you guys anticipating building out for as far as how many you could have hosted, entertained? We would have been at like uh, 50, I think is what we ended up with our, our rating at. Just, you know, with employees aside, 50 mm. people inside of there, um, which would have been great, you know, from our previous tap room that had like eight chairs, I think. Right. <laughs> so it would have been, I mean, we kind of built out our whole plans for it and then sort of had to crumple those up and start again. Luckily, right. we hadn't implemented anything. We hadn't right. spent a ton of money into into that edge of things. But I've still got, like, I, I built a whole bunch of tables that are just waiting to be put together the for rest that, of the way. For that glorious day. For that glorious day. <laughs> It'll come. These right. big, cool shield tables that are all enameled. And it's, it's, oh, they're, nice. They're nifty looking. Mm -hmm. So, But we were able to do bottles. And so we've always done a whole lot of our sales in bottles because we bottle up the majority of, of every batch ends up in bottles. Um, we do the kegs and stuff, too, for pouring in places, but as when everything shut down, we lost all the bars, the restaurants, the, the hotel bars, everything that carried our stuff that was just serving was, mm. was no longer serving. But we also get, you know, Whole Foods all across Arizona carries our products. Um, we have 
I mean, we deliver all the way down to Tucson. So wow. we had, that was, I mean, one of the pivots that we ended up making with yeah. it was trying to push more product into wholesale sales instead of retail sales. And so we were trying to, you know, get products into bottle shops that were still open, into other grocery stores that we didn't have, um, anywhere we could get it into. We mm. also had uh, our online sales. And this is something that, like, I didn't come up with this idea, like, all on my own. This was something from you guys. Oh, thanks. And it was, it was <laughs> diversity of sales. Right, was one right. Of the, I mean, it might have been a whole class, I think, but okay. it was it was definitely a portion of one of the classes um, talking about how you need to have your income coming from, from different areas mm -hmm. because it was if you have it all coming from one direction and that falters yeah. for whatever reason, it eventually inevitably will. Um, it's good to have different areas of it coming so that you don't get hit 100% from one area, but it only knocks out you know 30% sure. of something. It makes it a manageable pivot. Sure. So, so let's talk about pivots for a quick second. So I'm sure like that's something also entrepreneurs can get just so grounded in, in their con their own concepts, that own yes. initial thought of here's what I'm going to do. And by God, come rain or shine, I'm going to do this thing. I'm sure there are still some of those things in your head that Always. you were not going to bend on. Yeah. But what, so what adjustments have you made that were tough pivots? Um, bringing up more of the online sales stuff okay. is hard. It adds so many layers of, of taxes and state-to-state -state law stuff and everything else that it's it's kind of a nightmare as far as paperwork goes. Okay. But uh, we sell to 38 states or something now. Wow. Um, so you can get it directly shipped to your door, which is convenient and good, especially yeah. in these times. So so just walk me through this. What goes into, what actually goes into this bottle? To start with, honey, water, and yeast. And uh, one of the things that I didn't ever back down on, which has been kind of a, a frustration, but something that has really shined through with our product is that we don't use any preservatives in it. Mm. There's no sorbates, no sulfites, no no nothing. So it's as natural and healthy as an alcohol can get. <laughs> nice. And, and just, well, yeah, as it can get. As it can get. It's <laughs> right, right. still alcohol. <laughs> and and from, a, uh, from a dietary standpoint, if I am on uh, any kind of special diet, does it, would this will these ingredients appeal to me more so over potato vodkas or you know any other type yeah. of liquors? I oh mean, yeah, would, I think definitely. I mean, you know, sugar content like depending on the meat, it can have a, definitely a higher sugar content or a lower mm -hmm. one. But people even that are on like the keto diet yeah. and stuff like that, they Thank can you. drink like uh, our methaglen, our traditional um, plum. There's a couple others that like have no sugar whatsoever in the finishing product. Okay. And so people with with sugar issues with stuff can can absolutely still be drinking some mead. And like after after the honey water and yeast, it's just whatever fruit we decide to put in there. Or like the the one you were holding was mm -hmm. the root beer, which has like a cascaria bark, wintergreen leaves. Uh, you want to read all the bits on it? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, um, so a few roots and some red spruce tips that go in there. And so it, it's no fruit else goes in there. Nothing but honey is the fermenting sugar into it. Which makes it, I mean, that's what really makes mead such a unique product is mm -hmm. that it's, it's fermented from honey as opposed to, you know, like wine is fermented from grapes, beer is fermented from grain, mead is all fermented from honey, making mm -hmm. it just a, its own category. You, and you said something just now, when you talk about the stuff you put inside, how mm -hmm. long does that process take for you to introduce a new flavor? And where does this process even come from? Are you, are you just awake at night or dreaming at night of, you know, throwing various ingredients in? It's, it's kind of changed over time. Uh, interestingly enough, like when we first started, I kind of had a few ideas that I had been playing with or making at home that I was like, oh, I like the way these things mesh together. I like the way this tastes. And so we kind of came out with those. Um, the head brewer that makes a lot, of the, a lot of the mead now has got some great ideas. He brings his own kind of mental thing into it and his own palate and flavor into it. And then we get a lot of suggestions from customers too okay. at this point, which isn't something that you know we used to have. We used to not have a big enough customer base that people would on the regular give us suggestions for stuff. Um, and sometimes it's just walking in the grocery store or in a farmer's market and you see some weird fruit and like, I see something nowadays and I'm like, hmm, how would you ferment? <laughs> what do you taste like? <laughs> and what, is that, what does that process take? How would the timeline on that? To, we, from... it, some of them still take almost a year in to a, get all the it, way through. Is it happening in a barrel? How is it? It starts it? off in a big steel, stainless steel fermenter. Okay. So we kind of start off our fermentation like beer and then sort of finish it like wine. So okay. they all age for a significant amount of time. When you're making beer, like uh, two weeks is about from, from starting it until drinking it. It's about two weeks. Um, if we get a meat out in less than like six weeks, we're pretty happy with it. Um, and a lot of our staples that we do, traditional Bluetooth, um, strawberry, pomegranate, prickly pear, we've got those down to around that six week range. Um, and I don't think I would want to push them 
any faster than that. It would just mm. be not as good for the product itself until we find out ways. But I mean, I used to say that about it taking six months and I was right. like, oh, I don't want it to take any less than a year. Right. So like maybe we can find ways to, to continue to improve on the product and get it out even faster. Did, have you had a really bad one that you thought was going to be excellent and then it just didn't work out and never made it to the market? Or It was kind of the other way around. I had yeah. one that I thought was going to be terrible and then people ended up like, we, we made one that uh, was plum. So it was starting off home brewing like okay. you know honey's expensive and yeah. so you would you would save every little tiny bit that you you know you were testing it and you didn't end up drinking it even if it didn't taste good because you wanted to save everything you got and uh so when we started doing this on a bigger scale and it was you know instead of a cup it was you know 15 20 gallons i was like ah, i can't have this waste and so i would just pump it all into one tank and so like you know instead of it going down the drain we pump it into one tank but it was kind of the leftover mm -hmm. sort of funky bits off mm -hmm. of like 15 or 20 batches I got to the point one day where I was like, I need to test this and see what's going on. It's most likely just a whole, you know, 200 gallons of gunk by this point. And uh, go and test it, and it tasted pretty good. So it was like where, where our bees were at at that time is this orchard that has, like, plums, a lot of other stone fruit, pears, um, apples, all that good stuff. And so the, the, the plum was what was ripe at the time. So mm -hmm. we went down and helped, you know, pick 600 pounds of plums and took those, cooked them, turned them into a, a concentrate, basically, and then dropped the, the concentrate into the mead. And people loved it. It's one that, it's ran out, you know, gotcha. a few months ago, and we still have people coming back, like, you can make any more of that plum? Right, it's like, right. not that one. So there's some um, Innovate Waste mm -hmm. process going on here. So how many, how many, so again, I, 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 I don't quite understand all that you're doing when you're throwing stuff into the, the process. Right, right. But unlike beer, maybe, you can actually reutilize some of the original core ingredients to make a whole new variation. Oh, absolutely. How many of those cycles can you take, do you estimate? Infinite number, essentially. Okay. Like you can keep recycling stuff. We recycle a lot of our yeast with things um, is one of the big components of it. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of the guys that works with us used to own a brewery and he's always blown away by how little water we use for stuff because we don't wash grain. We don't, uh, the, the water cost is extremely low. We kind of throw around the idea that, I mean, the meat is, if you want to drink green, there is nothing greener than, than mead as far as that. it goes. Plus you're helping with the bee population. Right? I'm so assuming. you're helping with pollination, yeah. kind of for us to thrive as a company. I would like as few pesticides out there as possible right. because it ends up, you know, on a windy day, if somebody's spraying their field, it kills all my bees. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's something we'd love to see more restricted use on and stuff. I mean, we still need agriculture. We got to figure all that out too. Um, but, you know, it's, it's also something where... Robots are never going to take over a lot of this stuff, which I know <laughs> there is like are a robot concern. bees now. I heard about yeah, that, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, and don't... I also heard they're making honey in a lab now. Oh, okay, All which right. is crazy too. But anyway, but it's uh, but it's you know something where it's very very hands on for the most part, at least for now. Okay. It's very, very human where it takes people to go in and, and collect all the honey and handle the bees and stuff. And I even heard you say, if I recall, now correct me if I'm wrong, that um, if there is a shortage of honey in Arizona at farmer's markets, it's because of you sometimes. Probably. I mean, we're going through upwards of 1,600 pounds of honey every month right now. Um, so it's far more than just my bees alone can produce. We're getting honey from mountaintop honey. Okay. Um, I really like it. He's like the biggest small producer in Arizona. Nice. I, I, I'm going to switch gears with you. I yeah, want yeah. you to take that hat off and put on the uh, founder hat, yep. the co-founder hat. Let's talk about your co-founders or co-founder. Co-founder, yeah. My wife, Kelly Zarnecki. So Kelly, mm -hmm. and, and you surprised her with this concept at the wedding or you just said, hey, I want to do this for our wedding. It's a romantic gesture. And she I was kind of just wanted to do it for the wedding. Okay. And it was a romantic and, gesture and then... And then at what point was she ahead of you with this concept of a business or were you there and you had to sell her? How did, I mean, you're, it's I a new to, marriage. It's a new business. Yeah, you know, it's a lot yeah. of stuff you're jumping off right. of, right? It was definitely like not recommended. <laughs> like right. starting, starting a marriage and a business all in the same go. I think yeah. if, if I went back, maybe I'd do it differently, but things are good. So maybe yeah. I wouldn't. So she's, she's, she also has a full-time job as well yeah. as being your full-time co-founder. Yes. So how do you guys, how did you guys figure out well, so first of all, who had the idea? You had the idea and, and you sold her on it. Yep, my and, idea and sold her on it. I don't think either one of us ever expected this to be as big as it's become. Okay. Like, I really envisioned, like, I'll get a license, I'll get a little space. A little hot side I'll hobby. make it, and, like, yeah. I really assumed when I first started doing this that I would just still be making it in glass carboys. Okay. And making it five gallons at a time, which, like, it makes me smile just because of the ridiculous of, like, trying to do that viably commercially right <laughs> right right so so you, crazy. so she bought in 
She bought into it. And, and you we, guys jumped in. How did you decide what your roles would be? Because I know we have a lot of entrepreneurs who could be married or could it could be their brother. You know, there's yeah. always partners or oftentimes partners. This one is especially interesting because you're married. And so how do you how do you how do you balance that? How, and, well, and and what roles do you play? And I don't know that I did balance it super well for a long time. I think trying to get that balance between like life, play, and work has I'm still working on it mm -hmm. to be honest. You know. Um, and I think uh, when it started, like, she was primarily um, my sounding board for everything. I come up with ideas and just run it by her, and she's like, no, that's crazy. Don't mm -hmm. do that. And we're like, okay, maybe so, I'll still do it. But <laughs> So is she the business and you're the creative or the engineer? Is that? What I would say so, and okay. I say it's kind of changed okay. over time. I remember that because, in my head from before, yeah. talking to you guys or seeing your pitch. Yeah, and it's, it's definitely, and I, I think it's sort of changed over time. I think that's one of those, like, I don't ever want people to think of like doing a small business as like, okay, I'm coming up on this pivot. Yeah. Like it's, you're, you're doing little pivots continuously. And it's something that like I tell the employees in there, I'm like, when you look around and see what's been created and when you're thinking about what you're doing as far as your actions in, in this business, in this scenario, like this wasn't created by a, a few good ideas and a few good pivots at the right time. This is the culmination of a hundred thousand little steps yeah. all taken slightly in one direction or the other to lead to a spot. And so that being said, like it's, she has become more and more the creative aspect of it. Huh. Um, and she's pushing the idea of how to bring people into the meat hall. She's pushing idea of new flavors. She's pushing ideas of events and stuff like that and how to make them work with, with COVID and everything yeah. too and how to keep everyone safe and still try to draw people into a space, which is for any bar owners out there, they know that's hard right now. Yeah, so, yeah. so, so what advice would you give a husband and wife team about to start a business right now? What's off the top of your head? Communication. Okay. And it's still where we have issues, you know? And it's communication is the most important thing. And, like, communicating all of those little things, it's hard to kind of even explain how paramount of a thing it is to be able to sit down and properly convey your idea to someone which kind of leads us full circle back to the pitch, right? Yeah, back yeah, to yeah. the elevator pitch, yeah. because that helps you refine your ideas and be able to pass them on to another person and say, you know, this is what I'm thinking about this. And, and if you don't communicate that clearly, you may have a great idea and your spouse, your partner, whatever, may be like, I don't get it, you know? And to not be offended too by somebody not understanding your idea. Like if you have to go back and try to explain it a different way, like don't get don't get frustrated with each other, mm -hmm. I think is, would be beyond communication. Like the yeah. biggest thing is know that like they're in it too. They're in the same spot, in the same frustrating position. How do we help each other work through it? How do we find each other's strengths and support those as opposed to picking apart each other's weaknesses? Dude, I'm, I'm a believer in everything you just said. <laughs> you're either really good at selling me or you're really good at doing this. So no, uh, that's awesome. I, uh, yeah, that's, that's beautiful. And I hope that is, that's like, it's, it's, it, it's fascinating that it's the simplest things, right? It's the simplest. the simplest things that really make these things work at the end of the day. You it know, is. you talk about why someone does a company and then you have to ask that next question. Are you happy doing right. this thing, right? Because happiness truly fuels and makes a company successful if that founder is truly in, it, in, the, in the vein of doing this thing for the purpose of whatever they're passionate about. Yeah, absolutely. So, that's awesome. So where can people find... You said Whole Foods statewide. Statewide. You're online. Tell us what your www.drinkinghornmeadery.com. <laughs> All right, that's awesome voice. Uh, and then, and, and even in some local restaurants here yeah. in town. Yeah. Um, right now, a lot of them are still kind of yeah. working. Well, let's on pretend like back yeah. open. Okay. Um, but it would normally be. Um, gosh, I'm I'm kind of blanking without my sheet. That's in okay. Front of Don't me. worry about it. But but across the state. Across the state. Yep. Okay. And, and I mean, my, my biggest thing is if people are watching this and they see it and they're like, hey. I want that stuff. Yeah. Um, let us know where you want to see it. Let us know, or let even better, let your local bottle shop know that you want to see it in there. Um, that's one of the best ways. Like our customers have helped us get into new places. And you pick up somebody on social media that was like, oh, I liked your post and followed it. And then it was like, oh, I didn't realize you're in Arizona. Yeah. And then like, oh, I didn't realize you wholesale. And then they're yeah. like, hey, can you get it into this shop? And usually like, I mean, we've brought on, even during all this craziness, we've brought on, I don't know, a dozen, two dozen places in the nice. last two months with nice. everything. Okay. All right, Evan. Well, thank you so much for doing this with me. Well, here's to Drinking Horde Meadery and Evan's success as an uh, entrepreneur all. and all good. Well, that wraps it up for us. And uh, we will uh, check in with Evan periodically during the year. But make sure you check this awesome uh, liquid out for yourself. Liquid of the gods. Thank you. Liquid of the gods. All good. <laughs>